Hi everyone. A fellow named Lawrence Chang asked me a question in the comments about buying a mill, and I figured that would actually make a pretty good uh, video, because there's a lot of things that go on when you're trying to buy a milling machine. So there's lots of places that you can look, of course, for a milling machine or any machine tool for that matter. Uh, Craigslist is my favorite. Uh, of course, you've got eBay, you've got used tool dealers, you've got uh, the newspapers, which are kind of going out. Uh, you don't really see a whole lot of ads in the newspapers for, uh, for machine tools and things like that anymore. So on Craigslist, I'll look at all the cities that are surrounding me first, the closest ones first, and then I'll kind of work my way out. I find that when I go to the big cities, I lose out on a lot of stuff. First of all, especially a city like Chicago, things get buried very quickly because people are constantly posting tools. So you really have to dig deep into the listings or maybe use their search feature and look for milling machine or bridge port or mill. Likewise, if you were looking for a lathe, you'd use those keywords. You should definitely be prepared to lose out. A lot of times these things get snapped up very quickly, especially if they're on Craigslist. It took me about a year and a half to find my mill. And quite often I would call and they would say, oh yeah, you can come by and take a look. And then as I'm on my way, I would get a call that someone else already came by and bought it. So be prepared for some heartache. One time on eBay, there was a Supermax milling machine, I think, that was uh, up in Milwaukee. I drove quite a while. I mean, Milwaukee's not close to me. I drove all the way up there to see this, and I inspected it, and it looked great. I got back home, I placed my bid, and I was the high bidder until the last two seconds, and then someone sniped me. That's sort of the reality of the situation with eBay, especially in a bidding environment rather than a buy-it-now environment. Uh, people can snipe you at the last minute and then you lose out. So hopefully whoever bought that Supermax mill is rotting in hell is very happy with it. Used tool dealers are pretty darn nice to go to. Uh, first of all, it's really fun to go to their shops and look around. The only issue there is they know exactly what they have, so you're less likely to get a screaming hot deal on it. So most of the time you go there and a, a name brand Bridgeport is probably going to be around $3,000 maybe more depending on how many features it has. And you should be prepared to pay for those features. If it's got a digital readout, you're gonna pay more. If it's got power feeds, you're gonna pay more. Uh, power drawbar, likewise. Um, so there's all sorts of things. Uh, the variable speed head as opposed to the step pulley head. All these things are gonna add to the cost of a mill. Now, talking about screaming hot deals, I eventually did get my mill and I got it off of Craigslist. I had to drive about three hours away to get it. For one thing, the guy wasn't taking texts or emails. He only wanted phone calls. So I think that maybe scared away a few people or they just didn't want to bother. So I got really lucky on my mill and I got this for $1,200. That said, it was a really bare bones machine. It's a step pulley head instead of the variable speed. Uh, it had absolutely nothing on it. It had no digital readout, no power feeds, no power drawbar. It didn't have a single convenience. I've since added those things. So if you see a mill that doesn't have exactly what you want, don't forget you can always add them to it. And it's really not difficult. Uh, it doesn't take long at all. And it doesn't really take that much money if you're savvy. Anyway, I drove all the way up there and I saw this uh, filthy little turd of a mill uh, sitting in the corner of this guy's shop and I knew right then and there that was the mill for me, mostly because it didn't get sold out from under me. Don't get hung up on a certain brand name when it comes to getting a milling machine. If you limit yourself just to bridge ports, you might actually be passing up a lot of different mills that are uh, potentially cheaper uh, just because they don't have the brand name recognition. Uh, but also more capable. There's a lot of Bridgeport style mills out there that are actually beefier than Bridgeports themselves. Uh, so for instance, uh, Tree, Lagoon, Index, uh, the Cincinnati Toolmaster is a very excellent mill. That one ha generally has proprietary tooling which kind of makes it a little undesirable. But if it comes with that tooling, then it's actually a, a pretty beefy machine. Some others, uh, you've got the Burke Millwright, which is a little on the smaller side, so better for people with home shops that don't have as much space. Sharp and Supermax and Exelo. Uh, there's a, a ton of really good machines out there 
that, uh, that aren't as recognizable as a bridge port. But you can get a really good deal on the so-called no-name brands, even though they are uh, very excellent machines. So now let's dedicate some time to the hidden costs of buying a machine. It's not just the purchase price of the milling machine that you're about to spend. How much is it going to cost you to move it? Even if you move it yourself, you're still renting a trailer. For instance, I, I generally move it with one of the drop deck trailers that drops all the way down to the ground. You can roll a pallet jack on and off, but it costs money to rent that. You might have to rent a truck to tow that trailer. Uh, maybe yours isn't big enough, or maybe you don't own a truck. If you get one that's so big that you need to have it moved professionally, rigging costs money. Do you own a pallet jack or can you borrow one? So there's all sorts of moving equipment that is involved in, in moving a machine that you need to take into account. Another very obvious one is uh, that most of these machines are three-phase machines, so you're going to have to have either a phase converter or a variable frequency driver, VFD. Uh, those cost money, and a VFD is a little bit of a cheaper uh, way to go. You can get a VFD for a Bridgeport size mill for around $100 to $200, and that gives you the added bonus of variable speed. And then there's the phase converter, which uh, if you're going to do it, go with the rotary phase converter. The static phase converters uh, actually cut the horsepower by a third, so your one horsepower Bridgeport motor is only going to have two-thirds of a horsepower, uh, which isn't very much. If you're like me and you're no good with electricity or you don't have a whole lot of confidence in your abilities there, you're going to need to get an electrician to wire it up. That's probably not going to be cheap either. Then there's the tooling. Uh, depending on how much you spend on your mill, you're going to spend several times that on your tooling. The big ones at the beginning are going to be your vise, your collets or end mill holders, and your drill chuck. Those are the ones that you pretty much need for every job that you're going to be doing. Then as you go along, you can pick up other things like your dividing head and your rotary table and any other indexing devices you might need. Um, there's all sorts of angle plates and things like that. I would recommend buying things as you need them and sticking with the basics first. It gives you a little more time to look around if you're you're not really sweating for a dividing head, you can look around for a good deal and check Craigslist and all the other places. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is how to check for wear in the machine. First of all, the easiest spot to look would be right here on these ways right here on the saddle. Uh, this is the top of the knee and the saddle moves back and forth, the y-axis moves back and forth. But there should be lots of little half moon scrapings on the way that you can see. In my case, my machine has quite a lot of wear. It sat next to a surface grinder for most of its life. Uh, so most of the half moon flaking is absolutely gone. You can't see it at all. You just see remnants here at the very ends. Um, that's an indication of a lot of wear. The other thing to look for is that most of your wear is going to be happening right here in the middle of the table, right where you would normally have your vise. Most of your parts that you put on a mill aren't terribly big, so you're, uh, you're holding them in a vise and you're just working along the length of that vise. So the ways on the bottom of the table and the screw and the nut are going to have most of their wear in that section of the table. So if you were to crank the table all the way to the extremes, then you would potentially feel tightening at each extreme of the table, especially if you were to tighten up the gibbs on the table. It would feel fine right here, but then get overly tight at the ends of the table because of the excess wear in the middle. Another thing you should check is how much backlash there is in each axis of the table. Backlash is the amount of play between the screw and the nut that drive the table. And you're always going to have backlash. You're never going to find a machine that doesn't. My table has about 25 thousandths backlash in the middle of the table where most of the work is done and maybe about 20 out towards the edges. Uh, if you find a machine that has a hundred thousandths of backlash, there's something terribly wrong with that machine. Now you'll find backlash on both the x-axis as well as the y-axis, so check both of them. You don't really notice backlash in the knee of the machine because the weight of the knee and the table are always loading the screw in one direction. Now you will notice that you get more backlash in the middle where you do most of your work and less at the extremes of the travel. 
you can adjust the amount of backlash a machine has by adjusting the nut. You have to take the table off in order to do this, but the nut is split and you can adjust that to minimize the amount of backlash you have. You just need to be aware of the fact that if you adjust it so it's tight in the middle of the table, you may not actually be able to move the table all the way to the extremes because it just gets too tight. Now the way you check how much backlash you have is to zero your dial in one direction and then move it in the opposite direction until the table actually starts to move. In this case on my y-axis I have about 18 thousandths of backlash. As far as the knee goes, uh, it's very very common when you're lowering the knee to hear a high-pitched squealing sound. That's not necessarily an indication of wear, so don't take it as such. Uh, what is actually happening is that the screw that elevates the knee and lowers the knee is actually dry and it just needs lubrication. Uh, so you would put your favorite brand of grease all over the screw and that usually quiets it down. As far as the head goes, see if you can run the machine under power when you go check out the machine. When you run it under power, you can hear what the bearings sound like. There's all sorts of gearing in here, especially when you go to the low range, either on a step pulley machine like this or a variable speed machine. All those gears are engaged when it's in the low setting, so you're more likely to hear wear in the machine when you're running it in low speed. So I highly recommend running it through every speed that you can, high and low. If it's a variable speed machine, put it into both settings. Make sure you crank the machine to both extremes and listen to it at every speed. Low range is going to be a little bit noisier just because of the gearing involved, but they should still be pretty silent machines when you're not cutting. Likewise, if it has a power feed or a digital readout, make sure that works. A lot of times, digital readouts might get bumped, especially on the X scale on the back of the table. Sometimes they will get run into the dovetails on the column. Make sure there aren't any dents on the scale if it's got a digital readout. What usually happens if there's a dent there is it cracks the scale or uh, just bends the reader head, deflects the reader head on the scale. Uh, so what you'll see on the digital readout is it'll count just fine and it'll get to a spot, a certain spot on there and it will jump in its measurements. Uh, sometimes it's just a little, but sometimes it's six inches. If it has power feeds, check those out as well. Make sure that they run in both directions. Uh, a lot of times if if it doesn't, that might just be a brush issue in the motor. If they're servo power feeds, you can still get parts for it. They're very easy to work on. If the power feed doesn't work at all, check. There's a, a reset switch down on the bottom of it. Sometimes it gets tripped, so you can just check for that switch and flip it the other direction and see if the power feed comes on. Another thing to check for is marks on the table. It's not uncommon at all to find some drill marks where someone drilled through a part and right into the table. Uh, likewise, you might see a, a ramped cut where an end mill was coming out of the collet, getting pulled out of the collet, and it slowly cut deeper and deeper into the table. I've actually got a couple of spots on, uh, on mine where there was a chip under the vise maybe, and someone dragged it across the table and just uh, put this big gouge in the table. In general, those marks aren't going to horribly affect the accuracy of the machine because you can stone them down and then the vise is going to be sitting on the flat part of the table. There might actually be large chunks taken out of the table where someone over tightened a T-nut and blew out a chunk of the table. In that case, that kind of limits your clamping abilities, especially if it's right in the middle of the table where you're going to be working all the time. If you see these things, it's not necessarily a deal killer, uh, but I would definitely try to talk the seller down uh, because of those types of issues. I hope this video helps anyone out there who's looking for a milling machine and looking for advice on what to look for when they buy one. Uh, so, good luck in your search, and I'll see you next time.